Good evening, everyone. My, uh, my name is Fred Huser. I am the Executive Director of the Presbyterian Historical Society, and I really welcome you to PHS, and I'm thankful that you are joined us, uh, you have joined us this evening for what proves to be a rather lively and interesting uh, presentation by Bill Leonard. Um, on behalf of the staff of the Presbyterian Historical Society, uh, on behalf of some of my colleagues from the Office of the General Assembly in Louisville, Kentucky, and on behalf of our Board of Directors who is meeting uh, during this period of time, I welcome you to PHS and I'm glad you're here. Many of you may already know something about the Presbyterian Historical Society, but for those of you that do not, let me give you just a very brief introduction in terms of who we are and what we do. 160 years ago, a group of Presbyterians organized the Presbyterian Historical Society. They didn't organize it here in Philadelphia. They organized it in Charleston, South Carolina, approximately nine years before the beginning of the American Civil War. They were concerned about the future of our church, and they were also concerned about the future of their church's past. So they agreed to establish a volunteer organization that became known as the Presbyterian Historical Society that would have a threefold mission. The mission would be to collect, to preserve, and to share the story of the American Presbyterian Church with the church and the broader community. That was our mission in 1852. It is still our mission today. One of the smartest decisions they made after deciding to establish PHS was to decide to put it here in Philadelphia. And since 1853, we have been in the city of Philadelphia, albeit in several different locations. The Presbyterian Historical Society is the National Archives for the PCUSA, but we serve the interest of the church as well as a variety of informational needs from throughout the country and across the world. Now, 160 years after PHS was established, history still very much is alive here at the Presbyterian Historical Society. Indeed, the new exhibit, which went in just this week, entitled Where History Lives, PHS at 160, is a reflection of many of the things that we have collected over the past 160 years, and I really hope that you'll have the opportunity after Bill's lecture to take a look at this wonderful exhibit and see some of the wonderful treasures that are here. But the most valuable resource that is at the Presbyterian Historical Society is the staff. These are the individuals that prepared the exhibit, and they are with us tonight, so I'm going to call you out individually and just either stand up as you are able or raise your hand or make some sort of a human cry to let us know that you're with us. Uh, there were a number of people who worked on this exhibit, uh, and they include Natalie Shilstedt. Natalie, you're here somewhere. Lisa Jacobson. Lisa. Leah Gass. Is Leah with us tonight? Okay. David Koch. Charlene Peacock. Elaine Shilstedt. Nancy Taylor. Nancy, thank you. And of course, Bill Brock. Bill, you are, you are here somewhere. I did see you earlier. Thank you. Uh, in addition to those who helped make this exhibit possible, uh, there are a number of staff members that really made this entire event possible, and they include our own Samantha Piccolo, our Director of Development, Kate Fox, our Development Associate, Barb Molyneux, the Senior Administrative Assistant, John Wood, Herb Beverly, and Alonzo Perkins, all of whom helped uh, arrange the logistics of trying to find places to park in a limited parking area. Now, I also want to introduce uh, very briefly two of our speakers tonight, and then I'm going to turn the, the, uh, the mic over to our board chair, Paul Watermulder. Uh, Jenny Barr will sort of be introducing Bill Miller, or Bill Miller, or Bill Leonard. Uh, and, and these two, in, in many ways, are, their projects are, are interrelated. Presbyterian Historical Society has a variety of wonderful medical records dating from the 19th century through medical work in, in, that was done in China. And as a result of a grant that we received from the Luce Foundation, we were able to composite, we were able to compose a guide to our China medical records uh, that will make these records, in a sense, far more accessible than they have been in a very long time. We are fortunate enough to have Jenny Barr with us, uh, who is going to talk a little bit about that project and will give you more of the details. Um, but the real guest tonight is Bill Leonard, and for those of you who know Bill, Bill does not really need an introduction, but I'm going to give him one anyhow. 
Um, Bill's story is a fascinating story, both how he discovered this long lost relative, but also how he discovered this part of his past, as well as how he discovered the Presbyterian Historical Society. Bill has been a member of the board for over five years, and the gifts of his time and energy in supporting this organization are foundational to the vibrancy and effectiveness of this institution. Bill's greatest contribution, perhaps, is his understanding of the meaning of history, why all this matters, why it's important, and I think you will see that tonight in the presentation that he will offer us. Bill, as you know, uh, uh, is a retired attorney. Uh, he has been retired, but he has certainly not been bored. He has been serving on more boards than any of us would care to think of, and we are blessed to have him serving on the board of the Presbyterian Historical Society. So having said that introduction to our dear colleague and friend, Bill Leonard, uh, I'd like to introduce our board chair, Paul Watermuller, who will bring greetings, and then Jenny, followed by Bill. Thank you. Sir. Well, thank you very much, Fred. I uh, join also in welcoming you. I am a member of this board. If you are a member of the board of, uh, of directors of this, would you please stand up so we can just see who you are. You serve pretty tirelessly and faithfully. There's our, there's our directors. Thank you very much. Uh, three times a year they gather here. Uh, from all over the country. I'm a pastor outside San Francisco and we have uh, those who are engaged in uh, Virginia and North Carolina, Tennessee, um, Kentucky, uh, Illinois, etc. The, um, the joy is to come to uh, meet with Fred and with other really thoughtful historians of our, of our church, uh, Jim Moorhead from the Princeton faculty and several others, and to discover the work of uh, collecting and preserving doesn't merely stop there, but it also becomes a work of sharing. You may have seen the most recent edition of uh, the little newsletter called PHS Matters. And in that, uh, Dr. Heuser has um, written a wonderful article on the role of, um, of schism and of, uh, uh, of disagreement and uh, upset in the Presbyterian Church all the way back to the time when our denomination began and helps give a historical perspective that can give us some stability and some vision as we go through uh, issues which uh, confront us these days. It is a joy to uh, be here this evening and to welcome and to anticipate not only Bill Leonard, but also Jennifer Barr. Thank you, Fred, and thank you, Paul. Um, before, let's see if I can make this work. There we go. Um, before I get started, I would like to thank a couple of people. Oh. Sorry, <laughs> stand in front of the mic. Can everybody hear me? Um, I'd like to thank a couple of people whose work has really been very helpful to me in putting together my remarks tonight. Um, our own Fred, his uh, PhD thesis was right on target for, for this topic. Um, um, he wrote about American Presbyterian women and foreign missions. His work is titled Culture, Feminism, and the Gospel. And if anybody's interested in this topic, I can highly recommend it. It's a really good read. He has a lot of information in there that really, um, he transcribes a lot of the words of the missionaries working in the field, so it's, it's really very moving. Um, Leah Gass, who's not here, um, graciously shared her presentation with me. She's putting together a presentation for an archives conference next month um, about the foreign mission resources here. And, of course, Bill, whose work has really helped frame my whole view of this topic. So I'm going to talk to you this evening about the American Presbyterian Mission to China, and in particular, the work that was done there by women medical missionaries. Um, I'll be focusing on the Northern Church. This was all happening at most of the time this was happening, the church was split into North and South. So I'll be focusing on the Northern Church. Um, though the Southern Presbyterians also sent missionaries to China. Um, I hope that my remarks will provide a broad context for the story that Bill will be telling you about one very notable woman physician. Um, can you hear me? Sam's waving at me. Um, working in Beijing, or Peking, as it was called at the time. So here are missionary families of the North China Mission, with all their children, 
This photo was taken in 1920. Um, just as a note, a lot of the pictures that I'll be showing are from the North China Mission, which is also, which includes Peking, and that's the area that Bill will be talking about as well. Um, Presbyterian foreign missions began at a time when the U.S. was really in a, in a mood of confidence and expansion, and they had a growing sense of their place in world affairs. Uh, Protestant denominations also were expanding at the time. Um, in the early part of the 19th century, we had the Second Great Awakening, which was very focused on evangelism. Um, after the Civil War, there was a big push to open up new congregations west of the Mississippi um, among pres uh, Presbyterian churches and other Protestant denominations as well. Um, and throughout the country, the Presbyterian Church engaged in home missions with Native Americans, uh, freed slaves, Mormons, and Hispanic and Chinese populations within the U.S. Um, the desire for expansion really expanded beyond our borders as well. Um, and in 1837, the Presbyterian Church formed an official agency to deal with the foreign missions called the Board of Foreign Missions. Um, just as a note, I'm, what I'm giving you is a very simplified version of the history of foreign missions. It's a lot more complicated and could constitute a whole lecture in and of itself, so I won't go into too much detail. Um, for example, before 1837, there were a few Presbyterian missionaries who went uh, abroad under the auspices of both the Synod of Pittsburgh's Western Foreign Missionary Society that was later folded into the Board of Foreign Missions, um, and also a non-denominational uh, missionary society. In any case, foreign missionaries, um, the movement really took off after the Civil War and continued to grow into the 20th century. Um, by the middle of the 20th century, the focus of the movement was really more towards supporting the development of indigenous institutions and social services rather than foreigners going and starting their own institutions. Um, so the period I'll be focusing on is really the 19th and early 20th century. Um, China was the first foreign mission field of the church after the establishment of the Board of Foreign Missions. And it would end up being the biggest field, um, biggest country, biggest population, a lot of interest in evangelizing in China. The missionary effort in China was really made possible by the geopolitical situation that was happening at the time. The Western powers were trying to force themselves into China to take advantage of the great market there, and uh, the British, but also other Western powers. Um, before 1842, foreigners were either restricted from entering the country at all, or they were very limited in where they could go and what kinds of activities they could engage in. Um, after the conclusion of the two opium wars that were fought between Britain and China between 1839 and 1860, um, there were treaties signed that um, part, of, part of which was China granting concessions to the Western powers. And those concessions included the establishment of settlements in five cities, um, port cities, and then later after the second treaty um, it included things like the freedom of the foreigners to worship and build houses of worship and then do missionary work. So there were some protections for missionaries after the second of these treaties. Um, so missionaries initially set up in these port cities um, and then after the signing of the second treaty they really were able to start building mission stations outside of those cities. So that's when the building of the stations really began in earnest after 1860. Um, this slide shows seven of what would eventually be eight mission regions of the Northern Presbyterian Church. The eighth one is down here by Indochina, and it's not on this map. Um, the North China Mission that I'll be talking about is up here with Peking. And the first mission station in China that really lasted any length of time was in Ningpo, which is here in central China. That was started by... Um, Divi Bethune McCarty, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly or not, 
Um, he was a physician, so you see that physicians were part of the mission movement from very from the earliest days. Um, he opened a small dispensary and he visited people at their homes, and he also was an evangelist. So gradually, as other mission stations opened up. Um, Hospitals and clinics, more formal structures, began to be built. By 1925, at the end of this flourishing of the foreign missionary movement, there, the Northern Presbyterian Mission itself had 36 hospitals and 38 dispensaries. Um, so they've done a lot of work by this point. In that year, they performed more than 300,000 treatments. That includes visits to hospitals and home visits as well. Um, there were also several medical schools, and the missions also participated in union activities. They had union hospitals, union medical schools, and universities that they, um, co where they cooperated with other missionary societies. Now, I'm sure that there is no mission, foreign mission, in the history of the world that can really said to have been easy to work in, but China really, the missionaries in China really faced some pretty big obstacles. Um, many of the very early missionaries got sick and had to come home. Many of them died in the field. Um, there were anti-foreign and anti-Christian attacks, both on the missionaries and on their Chinese converts. And the missions were really caught in the middle of the struggle for military and political control of the country. You have the imperialist government, you've got various revolutionary um, factions and warlords, and the missions are really in the middle of all this mix. Um, as an example of the vulnerability of the missions, Bill will be telling you about what happens in Peking in 1900 during the Boxer Rebellion, and that's a good example. Another factor that really made the work really difficult was that they're doing this work in a country that is just beginning its push towards modernization. So the infrastructure, the transportation, the sanitation, getting supplies is all really, really difficult. So the biggest issue faced by the medical missionaries, of course, is a huge need for medical services. Um, China has at this point, when missionaries come, a long-standing traditional medical practice, but it's not sufficient to meet the level of diseases and conditions that exist in the country. And there really is not much in the way of infrastructure, as we know it, of medical schools and hospitals in place before the missionaries arrive. Um, reports from medical missionaries um, say that common diseases and illnesses that they saw included cholera, leprosy, bubonic plague, smallpox, tuberculosis, many eye and skin diseases, tumors, and opium addiction, um, which was a big problem, thanks to the British. Um, and one report also lists demon possession as a common complaint, and sometimes the opium addiction is attributed to demons. It's, I don't know how much of that comes from the Chinese patients and how much of that is the translation by the missionaries for a home audience. That's sort of an open question. Um, so the caption on this map, which is from 1921, says that there are 400,000 patients in China, or citizens in China, to every doctor. So there really is a huge need for physicians. So women played a very important role in the missions, both on the home front and in the foreign field. Um, in the US, there were women's missionary societies that did um, a lot of work for the support of missions. They recruited missionaries. They especially recruited women missionaries. And they did a huge amount of fundraising. And they supported individual missionaries, many of the single women were supported by the Women's uh, Missionary Societies. And they also did a lot of fundraising to build the institutions in China, the hospitals, the orphanages, the um, schools for the blind and deaf, and medical schools. Um, in the mission field, 
Some women worked alongside their husbands as missionary wives, and their role might have been seen sort of as secondary to their husband's work. But there were also many single women and many professional women, both married and single, in the field. Um, at the peak of mission, <coughs> excuse me, at the peak of mission work in China, about half, of, more than half of the force was made up of women, and of those, half of them were single women. These are three of the women assigned to the North China Mission. On the left, we have Dr. Um, Clementine Bash. On the right, we have Dr. Myrtle Hinkhouse. And in the center, we have Orpha Gould, who's our registered nurse. So for many women, as you can tell from the number of single women and professional women engaged in foreign missionary work, this work really provides both personal and professional opportunities that they would be hard-pressed to find here. It would be a lot harder to get an equivalent level of experience and skill in a job here. Um, in the 19th century, not very many uh, medical schools were open to women, and good opportunities for practice once you had your medical degree were also pretty, pretty hard to find, although in the 19th century you see the beginnings of medical schools for women. Um, the what is it called? The Medical College of Philadelphia. Women's Medical College of Philadelphia is a case in point, and a lot of the missionaries who went overseas were trained there. Um, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, in 1900, only 6% of practicing physicians were women. Um, as a striking contrast to that, 30% of the physicians appointed by the Board of Foreign Missions during the peak of the missionary movement were women. So it's really a good way to go be a doctor. Um, so in missionary medical practice, women had a lot of autonomy in their work, and they also had the opportunity to get a really wide range of experience, both with the wild range of, treat of illnesses that they treated, <coughs> excuse me, and in the opportunity to take on leadership positions, a lot of the hospitals in China missions were basically built by women. They wrote home and they got the funds and they organized it all and they built these hospitals. Um, so Bill's story is a really good illustration of this point, which you will hear in a few minutes. Um, the other thing about the missionary work is that it fulfilled what for many of the women was a very strong call to service, to serve their fellow man and to help with the evangelization of the world that the church was engaged in. That was a, if you read the application forms of these women, that's something that they almost always say. So women physicians in the foreign field were typically assigned to work with women and children. Um, the phrase woman's work for woman is a common one um, that talks about that relationship. In practice, the division wasn't always quite so strict um, if a male doctor goes on furlough, a woman might fill in for him and vice versa, so it's not not completely cut and dry. Um, traditional Chinese customs of female seclusion meant that, um, especially among the higher classes of, of women at the time, meant that women might not come to see a male doctor if they didn't have to, and they might not come to a hospital that treats male patients if they don't have to. So it was important for the missions to build these hospitals for women, and also for the women physicians to continue to visit the women in their homes. Um, here are a few images that illustrate some of this medical work. Um, we've got some patients waiting to see the doctor. You can see there, some of them have the bound feet. This was a traditional practice that um, had gone on for a long time in China, and the missionaries discouraged it, and some of if, um, sometimes for boarding schools, a condition for acceptance into the boarding school would be that you unbound your feet for the kids. Um, eventually, the imperial government would outlaw the practice as well. This is Dr. Maud Mackey, who's another physician with the North China Mission, pulling a tooth. This is Dr. Clementine Bash. Um, working with a Chinese nurse, giving her orders in a hospital in um, Peking, Dao Hospital, 
which you'll hear more about later as well. And this is Orpha Gould, the nurse, and I love this picture. I don't know if you can see it from back there, but she has a big smile on her face, and most of the pictures that you find of missionaries are very serious looking, so I just love this picture. Um, here's another view where you can see the bound feet. I don't know if this is a patient, or this is an unlabeled photograph, and I don't know if it's a patient or maybe a, um, an assistant in the hospital or maybe just the neighbor, but I, I like that picture too. So, as I mentioned before, the, the doctors, the patients didn't always come to see the doctors in the hospital. Sometimes the doctors went out to see the patients as well. Um, the, they visited homes right in the neighborhood of the mission, and then they made longer trips out into the countryside, um, itinerating um, longer journeys to see people who really would have little or no way of getting to a hospital. Um, and this is a little village clinic. They sometimes worked out of small clinics and villages, and here's an example of that. Um, on the itinerating trips, because transportation was really difficult, they had to be creative about how they got around. So this is a houseboat. It's maybe a little hard to see this picture. Um, used for itinerating on canals and rivers. And then here is Dr. Hinkhouse in a cart. And with her, she's got two women. She's got a Chinese nurse. This says her 1922 limousine. Um, she has a Chinese nurse and she's got a Bible woman. And the Bible woman was an assistant trained, a uh, Chinese assistant trained to talk about the gospel with the patients while they were waiting for treatment from the doctor. And here is a waiting room in the hospital in Pao Ting Fu, which is in North China. And um, there, I think that the woman in the blue tunic is a Bible woman, I'm not sure, but this is another um, chance that um, the missions would have to talk to the patients about the gospel. So there have always been many more, there were always many more patients to see than there was time to see them. The, the reports all give these crazy big numbers about the number of patients that they see and they all talk about huge waiting rooms full of people and there are a lot of pictures of a lot of patients waiting outside the hospital. Um, so it can't really be said that the missionaries solved the medical needs of China during their time, um, but what they did do was they created institutions in the country, both the hospitals that were eventually turned over to, um, gradually and eventually turned over to indigenous staff, and medical schools to train Chinese physicians and nurses for the country. And this, these institutions really became the nucleus of China's medical program. Um, this building, beautiful building, is the Hackett Medical College for Women in Canton, South China. Um, it was opened in 1901, and by 1930, they had 50 students enrolled. Um, it was a seven-year program with some pre-med. And eventually, this became a co-ed school as well. I think, I think when this picture was taken, it's a, it's a co-ed school. This is a group of Chinese nurses who are working in a hospital, this is back in North China again, in Pao Ting Fu. So a lot of the staff of the hospitals were Chinese. And this is one of the very first classes of graduates um, and some faculty of the North China Union Medical School for Women in Peking. And in the middle is Dr. Pointer, is Dr. Eliza Leonard, about whom you will hear more in a few minutes. So in China, the medical missionaries really left this legacy of these institutions, and that's a very important legacy for them to leave. Another legacy that they've left for us is the written record of their work, and that is here. A lot of it is here. Um, we have official agency records of the board. We've got records of the missions themselves, and we've got a lot of personal collections. We have letters, reports, minutes, diaries, memoirs, photographs, and these things all tell the stories of these people who were willing to give up their entire lives. They got a lot out of it too, but they gave up their homes and their families, and they went to the other side of the globe to provide medical service to people. Just, it's an amazing thing to do. Um, for their contemporaries back in the US, they were sending back writings and reports and articles about their work that really provided 
their audience with insights into the Chinese people and culture that they otherwise weren't getting. And for us, what it really does is helps uncover this piece of history of the history of medicine and an important part of the history of the Presbyterian Church. Um, so now, Bill will tell you the story of one of the women who made a really remarkable contribution to the field of medical missions. <laughs> 